last week on APTN Investigates. I didn't really process it. I hadn't really... I was kind of more so in shock, I guess, at the fact that it had happened because she just told me that he had died in police custody, that I... To not, that there was nothing that we could do. It, it's most definitely concerning that um, not only am I related to, to some that have died, uh, but just the, the high, high rates of incarceration and, and in custody death here in Prince George. Racism in the police, discrimination in policing is not just the structures, it's not just individual bad apples, it's individual people, it is the culture that doesn't hold those people accountable and rewards people for keeping your mouth shut. History repeats itself because president hasn't listened and what we're showing right now Halifax is paying attention this week's episode no justice no peace no justice no peace black lives matter black lives matter What else to do but keep trying to find out answers? Because we deserve that. My, like my mom, my mom and myself and my other children. A lot of people actually showed up for his funeral and they all want answers. Three years ago, Dale Culver died in police custody in Prince George, British Columbia. His daughter, Lily Speed Namox, has been looking for answers ever since. That nothing is being done. Nothing has been, there's been no apologies from any RCMP, not even just the general RCMP public, as just a general, I'm sorry that this happened to your family, that this is, that our people have done this to your people. British Columbia's Independent Investigation Office has recommended five charges for RCMP officers involved in the death of Dale Culver. But the family now waits for the Crown to decide if they move ahead or not. Culver's family has been navigating the legal system with very little support. You know, it's, it's not normal to have to go through it, so you don't really know you're having a bad day and you're not quite sure why. And or you got a chip on your shoulder one day and you don't really know why. You see a police officer and your instant fear you feel that we shouldn't have to feel. We live in Canada. Terry TG is BC Regional Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. He's been advocating for changes in policing. Uh, uh, supports for First Nations that have, are going through uh, not only in custody death, but also supports for, um, I think overall within the justice and policing system, uh, seeing that there is harm to First Nations, but also too, I think uh, it speaks to the, the overall general concern about the high incarceration rates and, and, and death in custody is to uh, look at alternatives to this judicial system. In 2020, his own family was affected. His cousin, Everett Patrick, died from injuries while in custody at the Prince George RCMP detachment. Uh, you know, being a family member, it's, it's very sad because, you, you know, we don't have you know, uh, Ever Patrick has, has left uh, children behind and, and you know, uh, relatives of mine that, uh, you know, have uh, loved ones that are, that are gone now. So it's, it's, it's certainly sad. In October, another relative of TG 
23-year-old Chad George, was picked up by RCMP and died days later in a Prince George Correctional Center. One hour away from Prince George, in the town of Vanderhoof, Natasha George hears a train passing, and it reminds her of her son. So the train just went by, and uh, when me and my son spent a lot of time together, um, <clears throat> it just went by. So right now I'm talking about him, and it, it just seems like a sign, and it's like him saying, Ooh, you're, you're telling my story. And Chad George grew up in the northern BC town, Hazleton, but spent the majority of his life in Prince George. He and his mother both spent long periods homeless. He was picked up by RCMP for a prior legal matter and died a few days later in a regional correctional center. And right now they're investigating his death. Um, there's still a separate uh, PC coroner's uh, investigation going on. And the PDRCC, I think, is still under investigation. Um, it was hard burying my son. Um, one of the most difficult times in my life and um, really chaotic. I never ever did think that, that um, Chad was gonna pass away because I was originally pe uh, preparing him for winter. When I got the phone call, I had to go see Chad in a different way when I was supposed to see him that Tuesday alive and I ended up going and waiting to see his body. And the Independent Investigation Office cleared the RCMP of wrongdoing. The Prince George Regional Correction Center is doing an internal review of his death. Chad George's family wait for a coroner's report. His mother, Natasha George, hired a lawyer and is looking for answers. The story is, is that even if it hurts, I want the truth. And then I could take action. And if it was wrongful death, I want justice. And I'm going to work for it, and I'm going to like, like follow up with leads, and I'm going to pursue it. And I'm not going to give up, because my son meant the world to me, and uh, his life was precious to me. Three men, all related, who died in custody in Prince George within a three-year period. Patrick died in April of 2020, with very little media coverage. One month later, in the United States, George Floyd died when a police officer kneeled on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Black Lives Matter rallies erupted around the world. I'm a PhD candidate in criminology at the University of Toronto. My research largely focuses on police use of force, oversight, accountability, and its impact on Indigenous and Black community members across Canada. Criminologist Eric Lamming shares his thoughts on the impact of the rallies. I think it has the potential to make great change, but the problem with these changes is that they're always so slow in coming, um, and we won't know the effect for years to come. Lily Speed Namox hopes the global cry for change leads to police accountability here at home. I hope for justice. I hope for justice not only just for my dad, but for all the other people that have died in police custody. Everett, Pat Everett Patrick, um, my cousin Chad, who died in police custody not that long ago, and for anybody else, George Floyd, Anybody else that has ever died in police custody is who I'm speaking for. Louder. Louder. 
after the break, the impact of Black Lives Matter rallies. And what did the RCMP finally say about the cases in Prince George? What has happened to these officers involved in these deaths in custody? Black Lives Matter was chanted by throngs of people marching for change in the justice system in downtown Calgary. Hundreds of people stand shoulder to shoulder here outside the U.S. Embassy in the nation's capital chanting Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, Black lives matter. and also Black for Indigenous and Native Lives Matters for all the injustices. In British Columbia, AFN Regional Chief Terry TG spoke at a large Black Lives Matter rally in Prince George. You know, with the movement, uh, with, uh, uh, with the, the death of George Floyd and, and also the, the death of many uh, black folks and brothers and sisters in the United States and, and Canada really highlighted, and, and, I, and I think this really, with COVID and this pandemic, really highlighted the uh, the systemic issues and, and the societal issues of, of the United States and, and perhaps even Canada. And I think, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and Indigenous Lives Matter for, for that matter is, uh, you know, really um, very similar um, in terms of uh, the issues that we face. Lily Speed Namox spoke at the same rally, raising questions of justice for her father, Dale Culver, Everett Patrick, and others. Um, I got to share my honest, true story and feelings about how I felt and what happened without anybody telling me, no, you can't say that. It's very, I want to say comforting, but not necessarily comforting because it's sad that it has to happen. But it is uplifting that it is something that is starting to get acknowledged and recognized as a problem. The Black Lives Matter rally was part of Lily's healing journey as she deals with the loss of her father. Anxious. Anxious. Um, Lily has stood up and spoke publicly about what has happened to her dad and She's just a kid, and she could be walking down the street one day or driving in a car and get pulled over, and there could be somebody there that could be held responsible for what happened to her dad. And she doesn't know, and it's not fair. It's just the system is flawed. There is fear and frustration, and families still have questions and wonder if they'll ever get justice. He never did anything to get himself into the position that he should have died. Even if he was casing vehicles, which he wasn't, he shouldn't have died for it. Nobody should. It seems that the rules are different. The rules are different for people that are just people and, or if you're RCMP. If Dale had killed a police officer, the whole world would know who he was. We don't have a clue. We don't even know one name of person that killed him. And it, that's not right. What else to do but keep trying to find out answers? Because we deserve that. My, like my mom, my mom and myself and my other children. A lot of people actually showed up for his funeral and they all want answers. Eric Lamming is completing his doctorate in criminology at the University of Toronto. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, he joined us remotely. Something that these, these investigative units, the civilian watchdogs, are trying to improve on. They're trying to have an investigation done within a certain time frame because it's not good. A delay is not good for anybody. It's not good for the officers. It's not good for the affected person. It's not good for the, the families involved. So the independent investigative units that, that investigate police 
conduct that results in a serious injury or death or sexual assault of an individual, those exist in seven seven provinces right now. So, I mean, we still have almost half the country that do not have one of those bodies in the province or territory. So, I mean, that's something that that needs to change right up. Uh, We need every province and territory needs to create their own body to investigate policing in that jurisdiction. The RCMP doesn't track ethnic-based data on deaths in custody or suffered injuries. Lamming believes that is key to change along with better oversight. Across Canada, most police services don't collect that data when they use force against uh, people, and that's a huge problem. And if they do collect it, they don't report it publicly. It's a huge problem, and that's kind of leads to the systemic problems that we see in terms of racism. I mean, if you if you can't identify problems, if you don't have those statistics or those numbers to see that there are patterns, then there's a problem with the whole system's kind of corrupt in that sense. Without the data, Lamming says it would be hard to start fixing the problem of systemic racism. You know what exists. It's just hard to get transparent data on how often it occurs or the discrepancies in that. I mean, from a study that I, that I co-authored in, with the Toronto Police Service, we, we found discrepancies with Black uh, individuals who are who are uh, the recipients of use of force at a disproportionate level. Same thing with Indigenous people in Ontario over uh, this dates back a, f- a few years now, but with SIU data, uh, we found huge over-representations of Indigenous people who have been killed or injured by, by police action compared to other populations. So, I mean, they exist in raw numbers. But the only the one problem that we have is that it's not consistently collected. Ontario Human Rights Commission data found a Black person was 20 times more likely to be shot by police compared to a white person. A 2020 news report from the Globe and Mail looking at deaths in custody in a 10-year period found Indigenous people make up one-third of the numbers shot by RCMP officers. The rallies across Canada call for changes to systemic racism But as 2020 moved on, the issues remained. On June 4th, Chantel Moore was shot and killed in New Brunswick by Edmonton police during a wellness check. A week later, again in New Brunswick, Rodney Levi was shot and killed by an RCMP officer. Then, the violent RCMP arrest of Chief Alan Adam in Alberta was caught on tape. An Anunavut man was shown being hit by the door of a moving RCMP vehicle. We sent an interview request to RCMP headquarters. They provided an email response on the steps they intended to take to eliminate systemic racism. But they did not consent to sit down for an interview. We have developed an RCMP equity, diversity, and inclusion program with a focus on identifying and reducing workplace barriers, racism, discrimination for diverse groups. We know we can always do better. We remain committed to building an organization that respects all people, values diversity, and fosters inclusion. The plan to modernize the RCMP is called the Vision 150, establishing the Indigenous Lived Experience Advisory Group, an office for Indigenous collaboration and accountability, and modernizing recruitment. Question, when is it going to be implemented? It, does it have the, the sustainable funding to keep going? Does it have the right people involved to, to kind of keep it going as well? Those are the things that we have to always look out for. But on paper, it sounds good. I mean, all of these initiatives sound promising. It's just, you know, we've heard the same things year after year to improve the relationship between you know, Indigenous peoples and, and, and police. And I think just the fact that the RCMP is just the way that it was formed to begin with, it's, it's going to take a lot more than just kind of these, these fluffy initiatives to, to really improve the relations. And- it's been eight months since the start of the investigation into the death of Everett Patrick. The response to my calls and emails asking for coroner's reports remains the same. It's under investigation. The family of Dale Culver has been waiting for three years. His daughter is preparing for the future, trying to make it to architecture school in Montreal. 
because that's where I would really like to go ultimately is once I get everything done and all my upgrading done for schooling and stuff I would really like to go there I think it would be really cool and just even just as a different space of scenery and stuff like that is a different area to be in new things new sites new people when this all happened I was 14 and being 18 now it is definitely a lot more just I'm a lot more mature I guess so I'm able to understand and wrap my head around things a lot easier and um, especially now that lots of like the um, morning and stuff like that it's more so passed through it's I'm able to more easily move on but it's not something that's easy to do without knowing any answers. No one from the Prince George RCMP would go on camera. They did provide an update and an email statement. Internal conduct is subject to the Privacy Act restrictions only in those cases where the matter results in a conduct dismissal hearing would the case be made a matter of public record. The officers involved in the Dale Culver matter have all returned to active duty with their respective units. Same token, the officers involved in the Patrick matter remain operational, assigned to the Prince George RCMP. For the family of Dale Culver, it's been nearly three years and a half since he passed. The RCMP officers involved in his death are still working. The RCMP could end up in court here in Prince George, facing two charges on the use of force and three on obstruction of justice in the death of Dale Culver, as was recommended by the Independent Investigation Office. But the Crown Attorney can take up to three years to decide whether or not to move ahead on recommendations. Uncomfortable to know that these people are still roaming the streets. It's very disheartening to know that they've taken two people's lives and they can just take more people's lives. It's really sad that that can still go on. and. If they were anybody else in society, they would not be still working, let alone walking the streets. They would be in jail. I'd like to see reform in the training process of the RCMP. Like, they have to understand um, they, how to deal with people. Like I know that he wouldn't be dead if it weren't for you. So I'd just like an apology and to see justice made for these people that have killed multiple people now and are still working and in our society. It's not okay. When Winnipeg Housing took over, from Manitoba housing, things sort of fell apart. Drugs, drugs is common. Tenants who are helping each other to rebuild their wheelchairs. Tenants who are helping one another to clean up the mold, the retribution that people have experienced as a result of management due to speaking out. And security can only be as good as the tenants that live there. It's impossible for me to use my sources or my names because, uh, frankly, these people will be attacked. It's not safe. It's not a safe environment. 